Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the Summerton Man. So, the Summerton Man was an unidentified man whose body was found on the 5th of December 1948 on the beach at Summerton Park, a suburb of Adelaide, South Australia. The case is also known after the Persian phrase, Tum and Should, meaning is is over or is finished, which was printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the fob pocket of the man's trousers. The scrap had been torn from the final page of a copy of Rubiot of Omar Khayyam, authored by the 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. Following a public appeal by police, the book from which the page had been torn was located. On the inside back cover, detectives read through indentations left from previous handwriting, a local telephone number, another unidentified number, a text that resembled a coded message, and the text has never been deciphered or interpreted in a way that satisfies authorities on the case. The case has been considered since the early stages of the police investigation, one of Australia's most profound mysteries. There has been intense speculations ever since regarding the identity of the victim, the cause of his death, and even the events leading up to it. Public interest in the case remains significant for several reasons. The death occurred at the time of a heightened in international tensions following the beginning of the Cold War, the apparent involvement of a secret code, the possible use of an undetectable poison, and the inability of authorities to identify the dead man. However, on the 26th of July 2022, Adelaide University Professor Derek Abbott, in association with genealogist Colleen M. Fitzpatrick, who I mentioned in my Isadale Woman episode, claimed to have identified the man as Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker born in 1905 based on genetic genealogy from DNA of the man's hair. South Australia Police and the Forensic Science South Australia have not verified the result, but South Australia Police say they were cautiously optimistic about it. Now we're going to get into the initial discovery of the body and investigation. So on December 1st of 1948 at 6.30am, the police were contacted after the body of a man was discovered on Summerton Park Beach near Glenegg, about 11 kilometres, 7 miles southwest of Adelaide, South Australia. The man was found lying in the sand across from the crippled children's home, which was on the corner of the Esplanade and Brickford Terrace. He was lying back with his head resting against the sea wall with his legs extended and his feet crossed. It was believed the man had died while sleeping, an unlit cigarette was on the right collar of his coat. A search of his pockets revealed an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from the city that may not have been used, a narrow aluminum comb that had been manufactured in the USA, a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette packet which contained seven cigarettes of a different brand, Kinsitus, and a quarter box full of Bryant and May matches. Witnesses who came forward said that on the evening of the 30th of November, they had seen an individual resembling the dead man lying on his back in the same spot where the corpse was later found. A couple who saw him at around 7pm noted that they saw him extend his right arm to its fullest extent and then drop it limply. Another couple who saw him from 7.30 to 8pm, during which time the streetlights had come on, recounted that they did not see him move during the half hour in which he was in view, although they did have the impression that his position had changed. Although they commented between themselves that it was odd that he was not reacting to the mosquitoes, they thought it more likely that he was drunk or asleep and thus did not investigate further. One of the witnesses told the police she observed a man looking down at the sleeping man from the top of the steps that led to the beach. Witnesses also said the body was in the same position when the police viewed it. Another witness came forward in 1959 and reported to the police that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Summerton Park Beach the night before the body was found. A police report was made by Detective Don O'Doherty. According to the pathologist John Burton Cleland, the man was of Britisher appearance and thought to be aged about 40 to 45 years old. He was in top physical condition. He was 180 centimetres, 5 foot 11 inches tall, with grey eyes, fair to ginger coloured hair, slightly grey around the temples, with broad shoulders and a narrow waist, hands and nails that showed no signs of manual labour, big and little toes that met in a wedge, wedge shape, like those of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed toes, and pronounced high calf muscles consistent with people who regularly wore boots or shoes with high heels or performed ballet. He was dressed in a white shirt, a red, white and blue tie, brown trousers, socks and shoes, a brown knitted pullover and fashionable grey and brown double-breasted jacket of reportedly American tailoring. All labels on his clothes had been removed and he had no hat, unusual for 1948, or wallet. 
He was clean shaven and carried no identification, which led police to believe he had committed suicide. Finally, his dental records were not able to be matched to any known person. An autopsy was conducted and the pathologist estimated the time of death at around 2am on the 1st of December. The heart was of normal size and normal in every way. Small vessels not commonly observed in the brain were easily disconcernable with congestion. There was a congestion of the pharynx and the gullet was covered with whitening of superficial layers of the mucosa with a patch of ulceration in the middle of it. The stomach was deeply congested and there was congestion in the second half of the duodenum. There was blood mixed with the food in the stomach and both kidneys were congested and the liver contained a great excess of blood in its vessels. The spleen was strikingly large, about three times its normal size. There was destruction of the center of the liver lobules revealed under the microscope, acute gastritis hemorrhage, extensive congestion of the liver and spleen, and the congestion to the brain. The autopsy also showed that the man's last meal was a pasty eaten about three to four hours before death, but tests failed to reveal any foreign substance in the body. The pathologist, Dr. Dwyer, concluded Included, and I quote, I'm quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. End quote. Although poisoning remained a prime suspicion, the pasty was not believed to be the source. Other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion as to the man's identity, cause of death, or whether the man seen alive at Summerton Beach on the evening of the 30th of November was the same man as nobody had seen his face at that time. The body was then embalmed on the 10th of December 1948 after the police were unable to get a positive identification. The police said this was the first time they knew that such action was needed. Now we get to the discovery of the suitcase. So, on the 14th of January 1949, staff at the Adelaide Railway Station discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloakroom after 11am on the 30th of November 1948. It was believed that the suitcase was owned by the man found on the beach. In the case were a red checkered dressing gown, a size 7 felt red pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pyjamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush as used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barbour brand oranged waxed thread of an unusual type not available in Australia. It was the same as that used to repair the lining in a pocket of the trousers the dead man was wearing. All identification marks on the clothes had been removed, but police found the name T. Keen, spelt K-E-A-N-E, on a tie. Keen on a laundry bag and Keen, K-E-A-N, on a singlet undershirt, along with three dry cleaning marks, 1171-7, and 3053-7. Police believe that whoever had removed the clothing tags either overlooked these three items or purposely left the Keen tags on the clothes knowing Keen was not the dead man's name. With wartime rationing still enforced, clothing was difficult to acquire at that time, although it was very common practice to use name tags, it was also common when buying second-hand clothing to remove the tags of the previous owners. What was unusual was there was no spare socks found in the case and no correspondence, although the police found pencils and unused letters stationary. A search concluded that no T. Keen was missing in any English-speaking country and a nationwide circulation of the dry-cleaning marks also proved fruitless. All that could be garnered from the suitcase was that the front gusset and feather stitching on a coat found in the case indicated it had been manufactured in the United States. The coat had not been imported, indicating the man had been to the United States or bought the coat from someone of similar size who had been. Police checked incoming train records and believed the man had arrived at the Adelaide railway station by overnight train from either Melbourne, Sydney or Port Augusta. They speculated he had showered and shaved at the adjacent city baths, there was no bath tickets on his body, before returning to the train station to purchase a ticket for the 10.50am train to Henley Beach, which, for whatever reason, he missed or did not catch. He immediately checked his suitcase at the station cloakroom before leaving the station and catching a city bus to Glenegg. Although named City Baths, the centre was not a public bathing facility but rather a public swimming pool. The railway station bathing facilities were adjacent to the station cloakroom which itself was adjacent to the station's southern exit onto Northern Terrace. The city baths on King William Street were accessed from the station's northern exit via a laneway. There is no record of the station's bathroom facilities being unavailable on the day he arrived. 
Now we get into the inquest. So an inquest into the man's death conducted by Coroner Thomas Erskine Cleland commenced a few days following the discovery of the body but was adjourned until the 17th of June 1949. Cleland, as the investigating pathologist, re-examined the body and made a number of discoveries. He noted that the man's shoes were remarkably clean and appeared to have been recently polished rather than in the condition of an expected of a man who had apparently been wandering around Glenegg all day. He added that this evidence fit in with the theory that the body may have been brought to some in Park Beach after the man's death, accounting for the lack of evidence of vomiting and convulsions, which are the two main psychological reactions to poison. Cleland speculated that as none of the witnesses could positively identify the man they saw the previous night as the same person discovered the next morning, there remained the possibility that the man had died elsewhere and had been dumped. He stressed this was purely speculation as all the witnesses believed it was definitely the same person, as the body was in the same place and lying in the same distinctive position. He also found no evidence indicating the identity of the deceased. Cedric Stanton Hicks, Professor of Psychology and Pharmacology at the University of Adelaide, testified that a group of drugs, variants of a drug in that group he called number one and in particular number two, were extremely toxic in a relatively small oral dose that would be extremely difficult if not impossible to identify even if it had been suspected in the first place. He gave Cleland a piece of paper with the names of the two drugs which was entered as Exhibit C-18. The names were not released to the public until the 1980s as at the time they were quite easily procurable by the ordinary individual from a chemist without the need to give a reason for the purchase. The drugs were later publicly identified as Digitalis and Oabane, both cardinolide type cardiac glycosides. Hicks noted the only fact not found in relation to the body was evidence of vomiting. He then stated its absence was not unknown, but that he could not make a frank conclusion without it. Hicks stated that if the death had occurred seven hours after the man was last seen to move, it would imply a massive dose that could still have been undetectable. It was noted that the movement seen by the witnesses at 7pm could have been the last convulsion preceding death. Early in the inquiry, Cleland stated, and I quote, I would be prepared to find that he died from poison, that the poison was probably a glucose side and that it was not accidentally administered, but I cannot say whether it was administered by the deceased himself or by some other person, end quote. Despite these findings, he could not determine the cause of death of the unidentified man. Cleland remarked that if the body had been carried to its final resting place, then all the difficulties would disappear, end quote. After the inquest, a plaster cast was made of the man's head and shoulders, and the lack of success in determining the identity of the, and the cause of death of the man had led authorities to call it an unparalleled mystery and belief that the cause of death might never be known. Now we come to the connection to the ruby out of Obai Kayam. Around the same time as the inquest, a tiny piece of rolled up paper with the words Tam and Should printed on it was found in a fob pocket sewn within the dead man's trouser pocket. Public library officials called in to translate the text identified it as a phrase meaning ended or finished found on the last page of the Rubiot of Omar Khayyam. The paper's verso side was blank and police conducted an Australia-wide search to find a copy of the book that had a similar blank verso. A photograph of the scrap of paper was released to the press. Following a public appeal by police, the copy of Ruby Up from which the page had been torn was located. A man showed police a 1941 edition of Edward Fitzgerald's 1859 translation of Ruby Ott, published by Whitcombe and Tombs in Christchurch, New Zealand. Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean, who led the initial investigation, often protected the privacy of witnesses in public statements by using pseudonyms. Lean referred to the man who found the book by the pseudonym Ronald Francis, and he has never been officially identified. Francis had not considered that the book might be connected to the case until he'd seen an article in the previous day's newspaper. There is some uncertainty about the cir circumstances under which the book was found. One newspaper article refers to the book being found about a week or two before the body was found. Former South Australian police detective Gary Feltus, who dealt with the matter as a cold case, reports that the book was found just after that man was found on the beach at Summerton, end quote. The timing is significant as the man is presumed, based on the suitcase, to have arrived in Adelaide the day before he was found on the beach. If the book was found one or two weeks before, it suggests that the man had visited previously or had been in Adelaide for a longer period of time. Most accounts state that the book was found in an unlocked parked car in Jetty Road, Glenegg, either in the floor well or on the back seat. The theme of Rubiot is that one should live life to the fullest and have no regrets when it ends. The poem's subject led police to theorise that the man had committed suicide by poison, although no other evidence corroborated that theory. 
The book was missing the words Tum and Shud on the last page, which had a blank verse, and microscopic tests indicated that the piece of paper was from the page torn from the book. Also, in the back of the book were faint indentations representing five lines of text in capital letters. The second line has been struck out, a fact considered significant due to its similarities to the fourth line and the possibility that it represents an error in encryption. So it reads as follows, W-R-G-O-A-B-A-B-D, then crossed out in the second line is M-L-I-A-O-I. The third line reads W-T-B-I-M-P-A-N-E-T-P. Then there's what looks like an X with a line through it and an underline right to the right of it. Then we've got on the, the fourth line M L I A B O A I A Q C. And on the final line it's I T T M T S A M S T G A B. In the book, it is unclear whether the first line begins with M or W, but it is widely believed to be the letter W owing to the distinctive difference when compared to the stricken letter M. There also appears to be deleted or underlined line of text that reads, as I said before, M-L-I-A-O-I. Although the last character in this line of text looks like an L, it is fairly clear on closer inspection of the image that this is formed from an I and the extension of the line used to delete or underline that line of text. Also, the other L has a curve to the bottom part of the character. There is also an X above the last O in the code, and it is not known if this is significant to the code or not. Initially, the letters were thought to be words in a foreign language before it was realized it was a code. Code experts were called in at the time to decipher the lines, but were unsuccessful, and amateurs also attempted to crack the code. In 1978, following a request from ABC television journalist Stuart Littlemore, Department of Defense cryptographers analyzed the handwritten text. The cryptographers reported that it would be impossible to provide a satisfactory answer if the text were an encrypted message. Its brevity meant that it had insufficient symbols from which a clear meaning Meaning could be extracted and the text could be the meaningless product of a disturbed mind. In 2004, retired detective Gary Feltis suggested in a Sunday Mail article that the final line I-T-T-M-T-S-A-M-S-T-G-A-B could stand for the initials of, and I quote, it's time to move to South Australia Mosley Street. Jessica Thompson lived in Mosley Street, which is the main road through Glen Egg and I'll come back to that in a minute. In 2009 to 2011, Derek Abbott's team concluded that it was most likely that each letter was the first letter of a word. A 2014 analyst by computer national linguist John Ryling strongly supports the theory that the letters consist of the initials of some English text, but finds no match for these in a very large survey of literature, and concludes that the letters were likely written as a form of shorthand, not as a code, and that the original text can likely never be determined. Now we come to Jessica Thompson, spelt T-H-O-M-S-O-N, and Alf Boxall, and I mentioned Jessica Thompson before. So, a telephone number was also found in the back of the book, belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Jo Thompson, born 1921 and who died in 2007. Born Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Marrickville, New South Wales, who lived in Mosley Street, Glen Egg, about 400 metres, 1,300 feet north of the location where the body was found. When she was interviewed by police, Thompson said that she did not know the dead man or why he would have her phone number and chose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that at some time in late 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next door neighbour about her. In his book on the case, Gary Felter stated that when he interviewed Thompson in 2002, he found that she was either being evasive or she just did not wish to talk about it. Feltis believed Thompson knew the Summerton man's identity. Thompson's daughter Kate, in a television interview in 2014 with Channel 9's 60 minutes also said that she believed her mother knew the dead man. In 1949, Jessica Thompson requested that police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties as it would be embarrassing and harmful to her reputation to be linked to such a case. The police agreed, a decision that hampered later investigations. In news media, books and other discussions of the case, Thompson was frequently referred to by various pseudonyms including the nicknames Jestin and names such as Teresa Johnson Nee Powell. Feltis in 2010 claimed he was given permission by Thompson's family to disclose her name and that of her husband, Prosper Thompson. Nonetheless, the names Feltis used in his book were pseudonyms. Feltis also stated that her family did not know of her connection with the case, and he agreed not to disclose her identity or anything that might reveal it. Thompson's real name was considered important because it may be the decryption key for the purported code. 
When she was shown the plaster cast bust of the dead man by D.S. Lean, Thompson said she could not identify the person depicted. However, according to Lean, he described her reaction upon seeing the cast as completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint. In an interview many years later, Paul Lawson, the technician who made the cast and was present when Thompson viewed it, noted that after looking at the bust, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. Thompson also said that while she was working at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of Rubiot. In 1945, at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, she had given it to an Australian Army lieutenant named Alf Boxall, who was serving at the time in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, she had moved to Melbourne and married. She said that she received a letter from Boxall and, and had replied, telling him that she was now married. Subsequent research suggests that her future husband, Prosper Thompson, was in the process of obtaining a divorce from his first wife in 1949 and that he did not marry Jessica until mid-1950. There is no evidence that Boxall had any contact with Jessica Thompson after 1945. As a result of their conversations with Thompson, police suspected that Boxall was the dead man. However, in 1949, Boxall was found in Sydney, and the final page of his copy of Rubiot, reportedly a 1924 edition published in Sydney, was intact with the words Tam and Should, and still in place. Boxall was now working in the maintenance section at the Randwick Bus Depot, where he had worked before the war, and was unaware of any link between the dead man and himself. In the front of the copy of Rubiot that was given to Boxall, Jessica Harkness had signed herself Jestlin and written out verse 70, and I quote, Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before, I swore, but was I sober when I swore? And then, and then came spring and rose in hand, my threadbare pittance a pieces tore. Now we come to the media reaction. So the two daily Adelaide newspapers, The Advertiser and The News, covered the death in separate ways. The Advertiser first mentioned the case in a small article on page 3 of its morning edition of the 2nd of December 1948, titled, Body Found on Beach. It read, and I quote, A body believed to be of E.C. Johnson, about 45, of Arthur Street, Payneham, was found on Somerton Beach opposite the crippled children's home yesterday morning. The discovery was made by Mr. J. Loins of White Road, Somerton. Detective of H. Strangway and Constable J. Moss are inquiring. The news featured their story on its front page, giving more details of the dead man. End quote. As one journalist wrote in June 1949, alluding to the line in Rubiot, the Summerton man seems to have made certain that the glass would be empty, save for speculation. End quote. An editorial called the case one of Australia's most profound mysteries, and noted that if he died by poison so rare and obscure it could not be identified by toxicology experts, then surely the culprit's advanced knowledge of toxic substances pointed to something more serious than a mere domestic poisoning. Then we come to early reported identifications. So, a number of possible identifications have been proposed over the years. On the 3rd of December 1948, a day after the advertiser named him as the likely victim, E.C. Johnson identified himself at a police station. That same day, the news published a photograph of the dead man on its front page, leading to additional calls from members of the public about his possible identity. By the 4th of December, police had announced that the man's fingerprints were not on South Australian police records, forcing them to look further afield. On the 5th of December, the advertiser reported that the police were searching through military records after a man claimed to have had a drink with a person resembling the dead man at a hotel in Glenegg on the 13th of November. During their drinking session, the mystery man supposedly produced a military pension card bearing the name Solomonson, spelled S-O-L-O-M-O-N-S-O-N. In early January 1949, two people identified the body as that of 63-year-old former woodcutter Robert Welsh. A third person, James Mack, also viewed the body, initially could not identify it, but an hour later he contacted police to claim it was Walsh. Mack stated that the reason he did not confirm this at the viewing was a difference in the colour of the hair. Walsh apparently had left Adelaide several months earlier to buy sheep in Queensland, but had failed to return at Christmas as planned. Police were sceptical, believing Walsh to be too old to be the dead man. However, the police did state that the body was consistent with that of a man who'd been a woodcutter, although the state of the man's hands indicated that he had not cut wood for at least 18 months. Any thoughts that a positive, ad positive identification had been made, however, were quashed when Elizabeth Thompson, one of the people who had earlier positively identified the body as Walsh, retracted her statement after a second viewing of the body, where the absence of a particular scar on his body, as well as the size of the dead man's legs, led her to realise the body was not Walsh. 
by early February of 1949, there had been eight different positive identifications of the body, including two Darwin men who thought the body was a friend of theirs, and others who thought it was a missing station worker, a worker on a steamship, or a Swedish man. Detectives from Victoria initially believed the man was from there because of the similarity of the laundry marks to those used by several dry cleaning firms in Melbourne. Following the publication of the man's photograph in Victoria, 28 people claimed to know his identity. Victoria detectives disproved all the claims and said that other investigations indicated that it was unlikely that he was from Victoria. A seaman named Tommy Reed from the SS Cycle in port at the time was thought to be the dead man, but after some of his shipmates viewed the body at the morgue, they stated categorically that the corpse was not that of Reed. By November 1953, police announced that they had recently received the 251st solution to the identity of the body from members of the public who claimed to have met or known him, but they said that the only clue of any value remained the clothing that the man wore. Now we come to the part of the case that's been a little bit of a wrinkle that nobody has ever gotten to the bottom of, although various people have tried, that would be the Magnussen family connection. So supposedly contemporary reports considered the connection with the death of a two-year-old boy some six months later. So apparently on June 6th of 1949, the body of two-year-old Clive Magnussen was found in a sack in the Largs Bay sand hills about 20 kilometres or 12 miles up the coast from Somerton Park. Lying next to him was his, was his unconscious father, Keith Weldemir Magnussen. The father was taken to hospital in a very weak condition, suffering from exposure. Following a medical examination, he was transferred to a mental hospital. The Magnussens had been missing for four days. The police believed that Clive had been dead for 24 hours when his body was found. The two were found by Neil McRae of Largs Bay, who claimed he had seen the location of the two in a dream the night before. The coroner could not determine the young Magnussen's cause of death, although it was not believed to be natural causes. The contents of the boy's stomach were sent to a government analyst for further examination. Following the death, the boy's mother, Roma Magnussen, reported having been threatened by a masked man who, while driving a battered cream car, almost ran her down outside her home in Cheapside Street, Largs North. Magnussen stated that the car stopped and a man with a khaki handkerchief over his face told her to keep away from the police or else. Additionally, a similar looking man had been recently seen lurking around the house. Magnussen believed that this situation could be related to her husband's attempts to identify the Somerton man, believing him to be Carl Thompson, who had worked with him in Renmark in 1939. Soon after being interviewed by police over her harassment, Magnussen collapsed and required medical treatment. J.M. Gower, secretary of the Largs North Progress Association, received anonymous phone calls threatening that Mrs. Magnussen would meet with an accident if he interfered, while A.H. Curtis, the acting mayor of Port Adelaide at the time, received three anonymous phone calls threatening an accident if he stuck his nose into the Magnussen affair. Police suspect that the calls may be a hoax and the caller may be the same person who also terrorised a woman in a nearby suburb who had recently lost her husband in tragic circumstances. Now we come to international interest. So, in addition to intense public interest in Australia during the late 1940s and early 1950s, the case also attracted international attention. South Australia police consulted their counterparts overseas and distributed information about the dead man internationally in an effort to identify him. International circulation of a photograph of the man and details of his fingerprints yielded no positive identification. For example, in the United States, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, was unable to match the dead man's fingerprints with prints taken from files of domestic criminals. Scotland Yard was also asked to assist with the case but could not offer any insights. Now we get into the post inquest, so pre-2009. In 1949, the body of an unknown man was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery where the Salvation Army conducted the service. The South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save the man from a pauper's burial. Years after the burial, flowers began appearing on the grave. Police questioned a woman seen leaving the cemetery, but she claimed she knew nothing of the man. Around the same time, Ina Harvey, the receptionist for the Strathmore Hospital, opposite Adelaide Railway Station, revealed that a strange strange man had stayed in room 21 or 23 for a few days around the time of the death, checking out on November 30th of 1948. She recalled that he was English speaking and only carrying a small black case, not unlike one a musician or a doctor might carry. When an employee looked inside the case, he told Harvey he had found an object inside the case he described as looking like a needle. On the 22nd of November 1959, it was reported that one E.B. Collins, an inmate of New Zealand's Wanganui prison, claimed to know the identity of the dead man. 
1978, ABC TV, in its documentary series Inside Story, produced a program on the Tam and Shud case titled The Somerton Beach Mystery, where reporter Stuart Littlemore investigated the case, including interviewing Boxall, who could add no new information, and Paul Lawson, who made the plaster cast of the body and who refused to answer a question about whether anyone had positively identified the body. In 1994, John Harbour Phillips, Chief Justice of Victoria and Chairman of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, reviewed the case to determine the cause of death and concluded that there seems little doubt it was digitalis. Phillips supported his conclusion by pointing out that the organs were engorged, consistent with digitalis, the lack of evidence of natural disease, and the absence of anything seen microscopically which could account for the death. End quote. Former South Australian Chief Superintendent Len Brown, who worked on the case in the 1940s, stated that he believed that the man was from a country in the Warsaw Pact, which led to the police's inability to confirm the man's identity. The South Australian Police Historical Society holds the plaster bust, which contains strands of the man's hair. Any further attempts to identify the body have been hampered by the embalming formaldehyde having destroyed much of the man's DNA. Other key evidence no longer exists, such as the brown suitcase, which was destroyed in 1986. In addition, witness statements have disappeared from the police files over the years. Now we come to some of the many theories about the case. So, for example, we have spy theories. There has been persistent speculation that the dead man was a spy due to the circumstances and historical context of his death. At least two sites relatively close to Adelaide were of interest to spies, the Radium Hill Uranium Mine and the Wimera Test Range, an Anglo-Australian military research facility. The man's death also coincided with a reorganisation of Australian security agencies, which could culminate the following year with the founding of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation ASIO. This would be followed by a crackdown on Soviet espionage in Australia, which was revealed by intercepts of Soviet communications under the Vinoa project. Another theory concerns Boxall, who was reportedly involved in intelligence work during and immediately after World War II. In a 1978 interview for television, Stuart Littlemore asks, and I quote, Mr. Boxall, you had been working, hadn't you, in an intelligence unit before you met this young woman, Jessica Harkness. Did you talk to her about that at all? In reply, Boxall says, no, and then asked if Harkness could have known Boxall, replies, not unless somebody else told her. When Littlemore suggests in the interview that there had been an espionage connection to the dead man in Adelaide, Boxall replies, It's quite a melodramatic thesis, isn't it? Boxall's army service record suggests that he served initially in the 4th Water Transport Company before being seconded to the North Australia Observer Unit, NAOU, a special operations unit, and that during his time with NAOU, Boxall rose rapidly in rank, being promoted from Lance Corporal to Lieutenant within three months. That's a hell of an achievement right there. Now we come to the H.C. Reynolds theory. So, in 2011, an Adelaide woman contacted biological anthropologist Macy G. Hennenberg about an identification card of an H.C. Reynolds that she'd found in her father's possessions. The card, a document issued in the United States to foreign seamen during World War I, was given to Hennenberg in October of 2011 for comparison of the ID photograph to that of the Somerton man. While Hennenberg found anatomical similarities in features such as the nose, lips, and eyes, he believed they were not as reliable as the close similarities similarity of the air. The air shapes shared by both men were very good match, although Hindenburg also found what he called a unique identifier, a mole on the cheek that was the same shape and in the same position in both photographs. Quote, together with the similarity of the air characteristics, his mole, this mole in a forensic case, would allow me to make a rare statement positively identifying the Somerton man. End quote. The ID card numbered 58757 was introduced in the United States on the 28th of February 1918 to H.C. Reynolds, giving his nationality as British and age is 18. Searches conducted by the US National Archives, the UK National Archives and the Australian War Memorial Research Centre have failed to find any records relating to H.C. Reynolds. The South Australian Police Major Crime Branch, who still have the case listed as open, will investigate the new information. Some independent researchers believe the ID card belonged to Horace Charles Reynolds, a Tasmanian man who died in 1953 and therefore could not have been the Somerton man. Then we have the Jessica Thompson relatives. So Prosper Thompson died in 1995 and Jessica Thompson followed in 2007. In November of 2013, three other relatives gave interviews to the Channel 9 current affairs program 60 Minutes. Kate Thompson, the daughter of Jessica and Prosper Thompson, said that her mother was the woman interviewed by the police and that her mother had told her she had lied to them. Jessica did know the identity of the Somerton man and his identity was also known to a level higher than the police force. She suggested that her mother and the Somerton man may have both been spies, noting that Jessica Thompson taught English to migrants, was interested in communism and could speak Russian, although she would not disclose to Kate where she had learned it or why. 
Roma Egan, the widow of Jessica Thompson's son Robin, and Robin and Roma's daughter Rachel Egan also appeared on 60 Minutes. They suggested that the Somerton man was Robin's father and therefore Rachel's grandfather. The Egans reported lodging a new application with the Attorney General John Rao to have the Somerton man's body exhumed and DNA tested. Abbott also subsequently wrote to Rao in support of the Egans saying that the exhumation for DNA testing would be consistent with federal government policy of identifying soldiers in war graves to bring closure to their families. Kate Thompson opposed the exhumation as being disrespectful to her brother. Then we come to the exhumation. So in October of 2011, an interest in the case resurfaced. Attorney General John Rao refused to exhume the body, stating, and I quote, There needs to be public interest reasons that will go well beyond public curiosity or broad scientific interest, end quote. Felter said he was still contacted by people in Europe who believed the man was a missing relative but did not believe an exhumation and finding the man's family grouping would provide answers to relatives as during that period so many war criminals changed their names and came to different countries. In October of 2019, however, Attorney General Vicky Chapman granted approval for his body to be exhumed to extract DNA for analysis. The parties interested in the analysis agreed to cover the costs. A potential granddaughter's DNA is planned to be compared to the unknown man's to see if it's a match. An exhumation was carried out on the 19th of May 2021. Police stated that the remains were in reasonable condition and were optimistic about the prospect of DNA recovery. The remains were deeper in the ground than previously thought. It was reported that the body was exhumed as part of Operation Persevere and Operation Persist, which are investigating historical unidentified remains in South Australia. The authorities have said that they intend to take the DNA from the remains if possible. Dr. Ann Coxon of Forensic Science South Australia said, and I quote, The technology available to us now is clearly light years ahead of the technologies available when this body was discovered in the late 1940s, and the test would use every method at our disposal to try and bring closure to this enduring mystery, end quote. Now we come to the Abbott investigation. So in March of 2009, a University of Adelaide team led by Professor Derek Abbott began an attempt to solve the case through cracking the code and proposing to exhume the body to test for DNA. His investigations have led to questions concerning the assumptions police had made about the case. Abbott also tracked down the barb or waxed cotton of the period and found packaging variations. This may provide clues to the country where it was purchased. It was determined the letter frequency was consistently different from letters written down randomly. This is referring to the code. The frequency was to be further tested to determine if the alcohol level of the writer could alter random distribution. They observed that the format of the code also appeared to follow the quatrain format of Rubiot, leading them to theorize that the code was a one-time pad encryption algorithm. Now, a one-time pad is normally a code that, if done correctly, can never be broken. So, copies of the Rubyot as well as the Talmud and Bible were being compared to the code using computers to get a statistical base for letter frequencies. However, the code's short length meant the investigators would require the exact edition of the book used. With the original copy lost in the 1950s, researchers have been looking for a Fitzgerald edition. The team concluded that it was most likely that each letter was the first letter of a word. An investigation had shown that the Somerton Man's autopsy reports of 1948 and 1949 are now missing and the Bar Smith's library collection of Cleland's notes do not contain anything on the case. Mesa J. Hennenberg, professor of autonomy at the University of Adelaide, examined images of the Somerton man's ears and found that his kaimbar, upper ear hollow, is larger than his kayam, lower ear hollow, a feature possessed by only 1-2% of the Caucasian population. In May of 2009, Abbott consulted with dental experts who concluded that the Somerton man had hypodontia, a rare genetic disorder of both lateral incisors, a feature present in only 2% of the general population. In June 2010, Abbott obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson's eldest son, Robin, which clearly showed that he, like the unknown man, had not only a large kaimba, than Kayam, but also Hypodontia. The chance that this was a coincidence has been estimated as between 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. The media have suggested that Roman Thompson, who was 16 months old in 1948 and who died in 2009, may have been a child of either Boxall or the Somerton Man and passed off as Prosper Thompson's son. DNA testing would confirm or eliminate this speculation. Abbott believes an exhumation and an autosomal DNA test could link the Somerton man to a short list of surnames which, along with existing clues to the man's identity, would be the final piece of the puzzle. After discovering that Robin Thompson had died in 2009, Abbott contacted Rachel, the daughter of Roma Egan and Robin Thompson, who had been adopted and grew up in New Zealand. Abbott and Rachel married in 2010, and they have three children. The family has a painting of the Somerton man hanging in their home, believing him to be family. However, Rachel Egan's DNA has been analysed, and links were found to the grandparents of Prosper Thompson. 
In July of 2013, Abbott released an artistic impression he commissioned of the Somerton Man, believing this might finally lead to an identification. Quote, All this time we've been publishing the autopsy photo, and it's hard to tell what something looks like from that, Abbott said. End quote. In December of 2017, Abbott announced three excellent hairs at the right development stage for extracting DNA had been found on the plaster cast of the corpse and had been submitted for analysis to the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA at the University of Adelaide. Processing the results could reportedly take up to a year. While much of the DNA is degraded, in February of 2018, the University of Adelaide team obtained a high-definition analysis of the mitochondrial DNA from the hair sample from the Summerton Man. They found that the Summerton Man belonged to Helpo group H4A1A1A possessed by only 1% of Europeans. However, mitochondrial DNA is only inherited through the maternal line and therefore cannot be used to investigate a hereditary link between Rachel Egan, Abbott's wife, and the Somerton man. Now we come to Abbott's claims to identify the man. So on July 26th of 2022, Abbott claimed that he and genealogist Colin Fitzpatrick had determined that the man was Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker born on November 16th of 1905 in Footscray in Melbourne. The youngest of six children of Richard August Webb and Eliza Amelia Morris Grace, Abbott claimed his DNA identification from strands of hair found in the plaster death mask made by Australian police in the late 1940s through investigative genetic genealogy, matches were found for descendants of two first cousins of Webb's, both on the paternal and on the maternal side, indicating a high likelihood that the Summerton man was either Webb or possibly a brother of his. Webb had resided in Victoria and had a brother-in-law named Thomas Keane who lived a 20-minute drive away from him, which would explain the name on some of the clothes linked to the Summerton man. No death record for Webb exists. His last known records date to April 1947 when he left his wife, Dorothy Doff Nee Robertson, after which she filed for divorce. In 1951, Dorothy was reportedly living in Butte, South Australia, 144 kilometres from Adelaide. According to Abbott, Webb had possibly tried to track her down. Abbott's research indicates Webb enjoyed betting on horses, thus the coded messages could be horse names. Webb was also fond of poetry and had written some of his own, explaining the copy of the Rubiot. However, none of Webb's still-living relatives had known him in person, nor are there any known photographs of him as of July 2022. Forensic Science South Australia, who was still investigating, declined to comment on the matter. South Australia Police had not verified the result, but stated they were cautiously optimistic that this may provide a breakthrough. A few days later, the ABC published photos of Webb's brother, Roy Webb, who died as a prisoner of war during World War II, claiming they resembled the Somerton Man. Now we're going to get into a bit of a timeline. Now this is what everyone reckons the timeline is. Take it as you will. So the timeline circa 1905, Summerton Man is born, according to the common coroner's report. April 1906, Alfred Boxall is born in London, England. 16th of October 1912, Prost Thompson is born in central Queensland. 28th of February 1918, H.C. Reynolds has his identity card issued. 1921, Jesse Harkness is born in Marrickville, New South Wales. 1936, Prosper Thompson moves from Blacktown, New South Wales to Melbourne, Victoria, marries and lives in Mintone, a southeast Melbourne suburb. August of 1945, Jessica Harkness gives Elf Boxall an inscribed copy of Rubiot over drinks at the Clifton Gardens Hotel, Sydney, prior to his being posted overseas on of service. The inscription is signed J-E-S-T-Y-N, and the J and E are in capital letters. Circa October 1946, Jessica Harkness's son Robin is conceived, assuming a normal duration pregnancy. Late 1946, Harkness moves to Mentone to temporarily live with her parents, the same Melbourne suburb in which Prosper Thompson had established himself and his then new wife ten years before. Early 1947, Harkness moves to a suburb of Adelaide, South Australia, and changes her surname to Thompson, the name of her future husband. July of 1947, Robin Thompson is born. 15th of January 1948, Boxall arrives back in Sydney from his last active duty and is discharged from the army in April of 1948. July of 1948, Prosper Mc. Taggart Thompson hires a car proprietor of Mosley Street, Glenegg. Pears in Adelaide local court as defendant in a car sale dispute dating from November of 1947, establishing Prosper Thompson as an active in Adelaide from 1947. 30th of November of 1948 at 8.30am to 10.50am, the Summerton man is presumed to have arrived in Adelaide by train. He buys a ticket for the 10.50am train to Henley Beach but does not use it. This ticket is the first sold of only three issued between 6.15am and 2pm by the particular ticket clerk for the Henley Beach train. 
train. Between 8.30am to 10.50am there is no satisfactory explanation for what the Somerton man does during these hours. There is no record of the Adelaide train station's bathroom facilities being unavailable and no ticket in his pocket to suggest he visited the public baths outside of the station. Between 11am and 11.15am checks a brown suitcase into the train station cloakroom. After 11.15am, buys a 7D bus ticket on a bus that departed at 11.15am from the south side of North Terrace in front of the Strathmore Hotel, opposite the railway station. He may have bought it at a later time elsewhere in the city, as his ticket was the 6th of 9 sold between the railway station and South Terrace. However, he only had a 15 minute window from the earliest time he could have checked his suitcase. The luggage room was around 60 metres from the bus stop. It is not known which stops he alights at. The bus terminates at Somerton Park at 11.44am, and the inquiries indicate that he must have aligned at the Glenegg, a short distance from the St. Leonard's Hotel. This stop is less than one kilometre, 3,300 feet north of the Mosley Street address of Jessica Thompson, which was itself 400 metres from where the body was found. Between 7 and 8 p.m., various witness sightings. 10, 11 p.m., estimated time he had eaten a pasty based on time of death. 1st of December at 2 a.m., estimated time of death. The time is estimated by a quick opinion on the state of rigor mortis while the ambulance is in transit. As a suspected suicide, no attempt to determine the correct time is made, as poisons affect the progression of rigor, 2 a.m. is probably inaccurate. 6.30 a.m. found dead by John Loins and two men with a horse. 14th of January 1949, Adelaide Railway Station finds the brown suitcase belonging to the man. 6th to the 14th of June, the piece of paper bearing the inscription Tam and Should is found in a concealed fob pocket. 17th and between the 17th and 21st of June is a coroner's inquest. 22nd of July, a man hands in the copy out of Rubiot he had found on the 30th of November, or perhaps a week or two earlier, containing an unlisted phone number and mysterious inscription. Police later match the Tum and Should paper to the book. 26th of July, the unlisted telephone number discovered in the book is traced to a woman living in Glenegg, Jessica Thomas Thompson, previously Harkness. Shown the paper cast by Paul Lawson, she does not identify the man as Alf Boxall or any other person. Lawson's diary entry for that day names her as Mrs. Thompson and states that she had a nice figure and was very acceptable, referring to the level of attractiveness, which allows the possibility of an affair with a Somerton man. She was 27 years old in 1948, and in a later interview, Lawson describes her behaviour as being very odd that day. She appeared as if she was about to faint. Jessica Harkness requested her real name be withheld because she doesn't want her husband to know she knew Alf Boxall, although she is in fact not married at this time. The name she gives police is Jessica Thompson, with her real name not being discovered until 2002. 27th of July, Sydney detectives locate an interval Boxall. Early 1950, Prosper Thompson's divorce is finalised. May of 1950, Jessica and Prosper Thompson are married. 1950s, the original Ruby Otter is lost. 18th of May 1953, death of Horace Charles Reynolds, Tasmanian man born in 1900 and regarded by some investigators of the, as the owner of the H.C. Reynolds ID card. 14th of March 1958, the coroner's inquest is continued, the Thompsons and Alf Boxall are not mentioned, no new findings are recorded, and the inquest is ended with an adjournment sin die. 1986, the Summerton man's brown suitcase and contents are destroyed as no longer required. 1994, the Chief Justice of Victoria, John Harbour Phillips, studies the evidence and concludes that poisoning was due to digitalis. 26th of April 1995, Prosper Thompson dies. 17th of August 1995, Boxall dies. 13th of May 2007, Jessica Thompson dies. March 2009, Robin Thompson dies. 14th of October 2019, Attorney General of South Australia grants conditional approval for the Summerton man to be exhumed in order for a DNA sample to be obtained. 19th of May 2021, exhumation takes place, and on the 26th of July 2022, Derek Abbott announces that his DNA analysis has identified the man as Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer and instrument maker born in Melbourne in 1905. And that is where the case stands at the moment. As it stands, the Summerton man or Tamman Shud's identity has never been actually positively confirmed, and that is where the case rests today. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions that still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I have covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. I'm also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. That was the final episode. We will be taking a short hiatus and then we'll be right back in a few weeks stay tuned